So, let's talk about cranial nerve 5, the trigeminal nerve. Because of its size and sheer complexity, many students find the trigeminal nerve terrifying. So it should come as no surprise that we'll have the Vikings confront their greatest challenge yet. No, it's not the New England Patriots. Behold, the terrifying trigem serpent! <laughs> That's our scary three-headed symbol for the trigeminal nerve. So what do you need to know about the fifth cranial nerve? Well, the first thing is that it's predominantly a sensory nerve, though it does have a motor component. Autonomic fibers also course along parts of the nerve. All right, so let's give these heads some feathery flourishes to remind you of the sensory portions. We'll come back to the motor function in a bit, but for now, remember that all three heads have those sensory feathers. The trigeminal nerve begins in the trigeminal ganglion, which is made up of sensory cell bodies from the three divisions of the trigeminal nerve. We'll symbolize each of those divisions on one of the serpent's three heads. The first branch is V1, the ophthalmic nerve, illustrated here by the large single eye on head number one. V1 is purely sensory. It travels along the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus before exiting the cranium via the superior orbital fissure. After entering the orbit, V1 splits into the frontal, nasociliary, and lacrimal nerves. That cavern is placed between the serpent's first and second heads for a reason. We'll come back to that. So this Viking's war paint will represent the V1 distribution. See how the red paint matches the red gem on head number one? Specifically, V1 is responsible for sensation to the upper one-third of the face, including the anterior scalp, forehead, upper eyelid, conjunctiva, cornea, frontal-slash-ethmoid sinus, lacrimal gland, and dorsum and tip of the nose. Another key point is that the nasociliary branch of V1 is involved in the sensory limb of the corneal reflex. To put it bluntly, the corneal reflex is when tickling the cornea causes the eye to involuntarily blink, or what I like to call an eye sneeze. <laughs> to show that, we'll add these unhygienic nose hairs extending to its eye. See how that nose hair has a bunch of little cilia because it's the nasociliary nerve? Okay, so the second main branch is the maxillary nerve, also called V2. This is represented by these two menacing upper fangs on the second head. Again, V2 is purely sensory. And like V1, it passes through the cavernous sinus, which is why we can see the cavern in the background between heads 1 and 2. But instead of leaving the superior orbital fissure, V2 exits the foramen rotundum. So we've made this serpent's head more rotund. A nice round reminder, if you will. Now, after V2 exits the frame and rotundum, it crosses the pterygopalatine fossa, while giving off some branches, exiting the infraorbital foramen, and becoming the infraorbital nerve. So, these green areas correspond to the distribution of V2. This includes the midface, specifically the lower eyelid, cheek, nasopharynx, upper lip teeth gums, and palate. And again, notice that the war paint matches the color of the second head's gem. Finally, the third division is the mandibular nerve, or V3, shown here by the bottom three fangs on the remaining head. Unlike the other branches, V3 has both motor and sensory components. But before we talk about all that, know that unlike V1 and V2, V3 does not travel through the cavernous sinus. It leaves through the foramen ovale which is why the third head is covered in those ovally scales. V3 is responsible for pain and sensation to the anterior two-thirds of the tongue, just like the two forks of the serpent's tongue flicking out between its three fangs. It also receives sensory input from the lower one-third of the face. This includes the lower lip, teeth, gums, and chin, as well as the anterior, inferior, and superior aspects of the external auditory canal. Dang, that is a place you don't want to be. The motor portion of V3 supplies the muscles of mastication, specifically the masseter, temporalis, and medial pterygoid, which close the mouth, and the lateral pterygoid, which opens the mouth. It also controls the anterior belly of the digastric, mylohyoid, and tensor valley palatini, which honestly just sounds like a delicious pasta dish. 
In addition to that, the motor fibers innervate the tensor tympani. This muscle dampens loud noises produced by chewing and can be remembered by the Viking playing these war tympani. Stay positive, my friend. One more point I want to make before we wrap up. Know that the trigeminal nerve is involved in both limbs of the jaw jerk reflex, a muscle stretch reflex. Simply put, tapping the mandible below the chin contracts the masseter muscle, allowing the jaw to briskly move upward. This reflex is normally absent or very minimal. However, a hyperreactive reflex suggests a possible upper motor nerve lesion. So, let's quickly recap. The fifth cranial nerve, also called the trigeminal nerve, has both sensory and motor components. There are three divisions of the trigeminal nerve. V1 is entirely sensory, covering the upper one-third of the face. V2 is also purely sensory, receiving impulses from the middle part of the face. Lastly, V3 is both motor and sensory. It provides sensory innervation to the lower third of the face, pain and sensation to the anterior two-thirds of the tongue, and supplies the muscles of mastication. Now, I'm no betting, man, but I think the odds are against the Vikings here. Stick around for part two, where we cover some important clinical correlates to see if they can turn the tables.